you that's agree? Not a, uh, I'm done. <laughs> now you can roll. Okay. Please take a look at your tag, note your color dot, and make your way to the table with the appropriate tent. So you'll want to sit on the other side of the U as well, if you can. Uh, Matt? Or there's space. Sorry, we moved the orange to one down. Can you move one table down? Sorry. We moved one table down. I think Cordelia is remote. Remote, blue. <laughs> Anyone else with a blue tag? Does anyone not have a tag? Okay. Okay, may I have your attention? May I have your attention, please? Okay, so after the online opinion collection, um, so we have, we can imagine that, okay, we have run a public survey for a month, and we have the raw data and uh, or maybe it can, it can be a round or several rounds of online opinion collection. So we have the raw data, the raw reports of uh, online opinion collection generated on polis. And we can also may have also had a secondary study or presentation on the discussion. It can probably be made by facilitator or made by the authority, competent authority. 
So we have these two materials and definitely have to submit it, submit them on v Taiwan platform. And at the mini hackathon, if the competent authority and the contributor thinks they are ready, so we can go on and initiate a the consultation meeting, so which is at stage three. Um, and this is, I will talk about uh, the preparation for a consultation meeting. And um, so in the introduction, I said that um, we, the facilitator should participate in the VTOWER process as early as possible. Uh, but if we haven't had a right facilitator in the earlier stage, then at least at this point, uh, we need to find a right facilitator. And he or she maybe can be uh, recommended or suggested someone uh, recommended by the competent authority or uh, by the contributors at Mini Hackathon. And we need to discuss with the competent authority and define the size and the scope of the issue. And this this work is actually has to be done again and again in a repeated way throughout the VTOWN process. And we need to host a pre-meeting uh, or also like a pre-training which is important with the facilitator and the competent authority at Mini Hackathon to try to let keep us each other posted, and so uh, to also to let uh, to let the contributors to understand like the facilitating style of the facilitator, and also let the facilitator understand what uh, the competent authority hope to discuss about, and. The pre-meeting or the pre-training has to be at least one week prior to the consultation meeting, at least, so that we have a lot of time to prepare. And here are uh, the things to do before a consultation meeting, and this could be uh, this can be just a general to do to uh, for a meeting. So it's like a rundown of the meeting, and the, for example, like the task distribution distribution, staff list, and pace and flow of the meeting, uh, and the agenda for promotion, like we can have press release. Uh, so like in, on VTAWA, we have press release from Executive Yuan, and also maybe prepare some posts, publicly post on social networks. And we use KKTX as the registration page uh, for VTAWA. And also have a list of invited guests and participants. And like I mentioned earlier, the unwritten rules is uh, uh, only the invited guests and the registered and the participants who have made contributions can attend consultation meeting. Um, and the fourth would be the seating plan. Uh, and also it need to be, uh, to if you have some funding then you can uh, have the attendance fee for the uh, like the experts such as scholars, professors, or lawyers, so on and so on, and also uh, a select selection of stakeholders uh, agreed by the contributors on v at mini hackathon. And in the in in, in consult consultation meeting, we have a printed notice for the facilitator, such as. Uh, the background of the invited speakers and copies of standing seating plans and handouts for the facilitators as a material, as a reference. And we have, we need to have an equipment list such, such as for doing a uh, transcripts, we will have a stenographer to, to have the, uh, to write down all the, the um, uh, speech uh, statements. And also like wall banner and agenda poster, live streaming camera, restriction table, name tags, snacks, and handouts. These are the general equipments for a meeting. And uh, one nice thing about transparency and documentation is that, because uh, as an editor, when I send out uh, invitation letters or, um, and, or to draft a public post for a promotion, and I like, because our all, all the materials such as presentation documents and papers are all online, so all I do is just list my our URL below, so it's quite convenient, and 
the invited speaker, uh, invited guests will also see that, oh, you have all these materials online, so it's a good, I think it's really good, and shows a spirit of documentation and transparency. And about the setup, this would be um, more physical. And we have a, like a standing agenda poster at the entrance of the meeting, meet, uh, meeting room. So this is uh, the agenda poster of NCI case. And we have the title of the consultation meeting. So this is just to show you as an example. And we have the agenda of meeting table here. And uh, I translated into English. So the order of the meeting will be uh, like reception and self-introduction of the whole participants. So they get to introduce themselves uh, like one, 30 seconds or one minute per person. And after self-introduction, the facilitator can have its uh, presentation to explain the process and also uh, what we have been done on Vita one on a specific issue. And then after facilitator's presentation, there will be a component authority's presentation. And then we will jump into a discussion um, led by all the participants. <coughs> and after that, a uh, facilitator should come to a conclusion based on the comments that we have uh, collected in the consultation meeting. And under the timetable, we have the venue and the facilitator's, facilitator's name and title. So this is a giant agenda poster standing at the entrance of the meeting room. And, and this is a wall banner. We generally have it above the facilitator's head. So in here, here we have a U-shaped table. So facilitator will sit at the bottom of the U and then just like where uh, Dashana sit. And we will have the wall banner just right above her head. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's huge, so it's, uh, it can show clearly, it can be shown clearly uh, on the live stream channel. And here, um, did you see any difference? Because the upper one was the original one for NCI case, and the second, the lower one does, uh, was a, the edited one. So did you see any difference between these two wall banners? It may be a little too small, but here, um, do you see a difference? Uh, the original one, uh, oh, this is a side story of NCI case. Uh, the, the original one, <clears throat> what generally speaking is it's not politically right because uh, it used like a, a blue, color blue, representing a male. Uh, yeah, just sh shooting the, how to say that? <laughs> Something. Uh, 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 so the female uh, with the color pink will be the victim. So I think this is really not right. So I call, because we outsource our design of wall, uh, wall banner uh, to the printing company. So I called them and said, this is not right. So we should use like a neutral color, which would, I think would be like purple. So then I said, okay, we change it to purple and you can tell what gender victims or uh, the actors would be. All right, so this is just a side story. So uh, just um, maybe an example to say that uh, we need to be careful of our materials and especially when like we uh, outsource the design of the wall banner or and our poster to printing company. And this is the layout of the meeting room. So we have, just like we had right now, we have a U-shaped table and this is the projection screen. So also here we have projection screen and the audio video crew and the camera will be right there. Um, and the seating plan, uh, we have different stakeholders to be seated in different section. So in here, uh, here is for the government. Oh, sorry. 
So yes? No, sorry, the government should be in the researcher part. Oh, yeah, right, so. <laughs> okay, now just give me a hand, please. Uh, yeah, in place of just swap them. And uh, here there were, uh, is like academics. Oh, yeah, sorry, so you might need to exchange your, no? All right, uh, and in civil society and uh, the private sectors, like corporate and business and companies. Yes. Why did you Why did you choose that particular order of arrangement? Government, academic, private, civil. No, no, uh, it was huh? It was wrong. No, no, no. In general, when designing the room space. Uh, Audrey, I. Because it is what it is, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the, the reason, well, th there's multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. um, the facilitator, um, actually there's usually more than one person in, in that uh, seat. Usually uh, we have a civil society facilitator um, and the minister in charge. It used to be Minister Jacqueline Tsai, now it's me. Uh, and the minister is there actually just to give the opening blessing and the final synthesis, and, and she's not supposed to say anything else. Uh, but the facilitator coming in from the civil society does the, the real facilitation. But it's important because um, then the academics and the government agencies, they're um, technically, they're invited by the political will of the minister. So it's important that the minister is sitting on the left-hand side sides with uh, the government and academic people invited by the government agencies. Well, they're still vetted and agreed by the civil society, but they're technically their invitation letter is from the government agency. So on the left-hand side is the minister and the, basically the, the people who are here because of the political will of the minister. And the right-hand side are basically civil society people and the private sector stakeholders reached by the process designed by civil society representing the, the Gov Zero uh, part of things. So that's like the, the atmosphere. And also because um, there's usually common language in, inside each group, so the need to um, translate and interpret domain-specific language, even though it, even the academic may be an expert on a separate domain, um, actually doesn't mean that they are an expert on the domain of the private sector, right? So there's a lot of interpretation and back and forth that need to go forward, so it's designed to be as simple as possible to have kind of cross-examination of issues when the same word doesn't mean the same thing uh, to the two different uh, parties. We can have two different cameras to capture their Perspective, um, you know, faces and <laughs> nonverbal expressions uh, when going through it while having the blessing uh, of the civil society, the Cup Zero facilitator, as well as the minister. Um, and it, it's pretty symbolic, actually, to uh, just gradually fuse or link together um, people's general understanding on this seating. So that, that's why we arranged a seating plan like this. Yeah, but I, I guess you can still, you know, adjust it a little bit. <laughs> it used to be if there's uh, a participation from the youth counselors and the legislators and so on, there would actually um, be a small table at the middle uh, of it, uh, and they're mostly as observers uh, and, and not actually stakeholders, uh, but they represent some other um, decision-making agency. So we'll uh, put them into the middle of it as observers uh, in the midst of it all. Uh, that's the general idea. Back to Avros. Okay. I have a question. So who chooses, I, I think it was mentioned briefly, but I, I want to be sure. So who chooses the stakeholders in each of the, um, of the civil society, private sector? Right, so just very briefly, anyone who posted anything on Polis or Discourse, uh, that's not obviously a troll, uh, gets an invitation <laughs> to, to be okay. at, present in the civil society, and we never get overrun uh, with requests. Most people just pre pre prefer to watch the live stream and type in uh, the statements. So that's how civil society is basically self-elected. Self 
uh, private sectors were predetermined. They need to be actually um, in part of the mini hackathons where we identify the private sector uh, stakeholders. It's generally agreed well before we even go to the police stage. Uh, the academics may be invited at the last moment <laughs> as, as long as there's some government agency that feel there are um, some factual issues that need to be cleaned up, uh, cleared up by academic contributions. Uh, they, they have a fixed number like five or something, uh, number of seats there and each government agency can suggest a list of academics uh, on a ordered priority list and the minister will end up giving the final uh, say on who to include usually to uh, to encompass as much uh, different fields as possible. And again, the government agencies are predetermined at the mini hackathon level. So those two are fixed and these two are fluid. Uh, that's the general shape. Yeah, and also we have a virtual space in the air. And so there's a chat room. So yeah, yeah there, we there's have a li two. live stream chat room. And the facilitator is supposed to uh, once in a while, bringing the issues, channeling it into the face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah, so facilitator will always need to have a like laptop or iPad uh, around, around, so he or she can check uh, the online uh, opinions right away. Um, oh yeah, here I have the, okay. Yeah, so uh, the facilitator will bring in the insightful or valuable opinions from the online chat room. So later, like we have on Zoom, we can have a uh, we have a remote online participants here. Then we can practice how it works. Um, yes, and the facilitator calls the shots throughout the whole meeting. That's uh, not a rule. So everyone should respect the facilitator and let the facilitator to control the, the pace and flow of the whole meeting. And on-site registration is not welcomed. So we get to, because we have the chat, uh, live streaming channel, so uh, we will uh, prepare in advance for everyone to have a name tag on the live streaming. So whenever a camera is uh, pointed at someone, we have a, um, like a name tag up, um, like a name tag above the screen so the online participants can uh, immediately tell who the participant or who the speaker is. So on-site on registration is not welcomed because it's not possible for us to um, immediately have the name tag for everyone on the live streaming channel. Okay, and the method, uh, we call the Aura ID method. Uh, it's um. It's a suggestions uh, or recommendation approach uh, for the facilitator to have a neutral mindset. So it's just a way of thinking. So now uh, we call it our ID method. And it's also called focused conversation method. So it divide uh, people's comments into four stages from objective, reflective, interpretive to decisional. And uh, you can see that objective represents facts and data. And I use V Taiwan as example. So V Taiwan is a project, and it's a fact. And reflective will be emotions and feelings. So I think V Taiwan is a great project, and it's uh, my personal feelings, my personal perception. And interpretive represents opinions and values. So uh, V Taiwan is a project that should expand. So it's more like a, uh, opinions. And the decisional will be the conclusion or decisions or the consensus is. So we concluded that Vita One uh, expands within a month. So this is, and this decision should be based on the uh, like O and R and I. So this is an example of how we use our ID method. And it's a really nice, um, like a rational thinking approach for the facilitator to be neutral, and to be neutral to listen to the uh, the the participants' comments when hosting the live streaming consultation meeting. So uh, we will move on to exercise three, which is uh, sorry, uh, a live stream consultation meeting, and uh, since you already. Uh, seats uh, according to your 
the color of your dots. So, CS, would you like to explain the rule? Okay. Yeah, so we're gonna abbreviate this a bit. Um, and also you're, uh, you're assuming, you're, you're gonna role play a little bit uh, based on what your section is. So we're gonna ask you to do is to put on your citizen or your government hat and think about your position in regards to our uh, polis statement or our polis like question that we had. Um, if you wanna take a look at the report, it's at vtaiwan-report. That'll give you the full set of data that you have. So what you want to do as your group is we're going to give you about five minutes. You can take a look at Polis, at the report, and kind of come up with a position for your group here. Like, what is your stance? Imagine that you're going to come into this stakeholder meeting and you have a stance. So maybe the government's stance is, you know, they think that no matter what, they are going to have control of citizen data and they don't want our resident data and they don't want residents to... Uh, to ever have an ability to share it, even though you know they might see whatever Polis is displaying, they might uh, they might go contrary to that. So that might be your position. Um, so as a team, spend about five minutes coming up with your position, and you'll get about thirty seconds to one minute to be able to state your position. And Audrey is going to facilitate a stakeholder conversation with all of our individual stakeholder views and using this polis data. Right. So um, in the beginning of a consultation meeting, uh, we're, we're massively oversimplifying this, but um, pe people are given a polis report, usually in the form of a slide share days before the consultation meeting, uh, that outlines two very simple things. First is the common values that people have despite their differences. And the second is that the openings uh, to potential solutions that could work for everybody. So uh, just using this polis as an example, it's clear that Nobody really knows what data is being collected uh, on them by the city. Uh, only a very few fraction of people uh, think that they know uh, what data is being collected, and this is uh, irrespective of whether they're uh, MET fans or some other fans. Uh, right? uh, that's that's the point of contention, obviously, but we're not getting there. Uh, and, the, and the second thing is that of the common value is the statement number five, which is residents should have a clear and accessible way to understand what data the city has and it's important, as statement 14, uh, important that residents know how their data is used and uh, most importantly, who has access to these data. So these two statements are almost synonyms. Uh, and interestingly, a more reflective uh, statement is that more police network camera on the street by itself uh, will not make anyone feel safer. Um, and so uh, that's another kind of opening. So just if, if we just go by those four statements alone, a natural opening will be um, so, um, if people feel, you know, not safer uh, about police network cameras, uh, what will make people feel safer and how could the city provide the data um, in a way that the residents understand uh, what they kind of data they have and who has access to the data that is being um, collected by police network camera. So one po possible opening is just to focus on police network cameras and uh, in which case this will be sent to the academics and the government people on the left hand side so they have some time to prepare a presentation that outlines only the factual part, so not their personal reflections of how cameras make people safer or not, but what existing uh, deployment of cameras are, what are the current rules uh, in sharing the data uh, that they collect, are they being used in statistical ways or some other ways to improve um, the public good or whatever. So uh, usually the sequence will begin with the government making a factual um, just responses uh, to those common values and statements uh, so that everybody is on the same page. Now, everybody can challenge them on, on those facts, of course, but usually it starts with the government making presentations and the researchers will make some possible um, interpretations and openings, very brief ones, since they tend to go on and on. The facilitator will <laughs> uh, time control the, the experts. So after this initial like 10 minutes um, in a usual collaboration meeting, then it's up to the stakeholders uh, to, to share whatever they want to share. And the facilitator's role is to gradually fuse uh, into a common solutions that seems to have the consensus of, of everyone. So, but 
well, you don't have a week to do the research, so <laughs> we're going to, to massively abbreviate it and just pass the microphone around a little bit, right? So just people make short factual statements or, then <laughs> or mock factual statements uh, from, the, from the government table. So, yeah, so, yes. We'll give you uh, like five minutes to talk amongst your group around how you wanna yeah. prepare your statements. Right, so, so just focus on those four statements since we don't have um, much time. Sunset date in particular on the date to your point. Like, but like, you know, like after a while, like that's going to end up in some sort of third party, you know, marketing firms creating that and like you know, part of like the profile. And then the underlying data could be deleted, but the data extracted from you and all of your friends that's already been stored. I, I worry about that in particular because it's like, you know, like I, I was joking earlier about how like I'm, I, I have a Facebook account. But like, it doesn't matter because people will tag me in things and they're my friends anyway, you know? And so, well, actually, I don't use Facebook in the browser except for application to access Facebook for that reason. But, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was doing that until Facebook saw it. Yeah, I'm going to do that actually. 
All right, we're starting in one minute. All right, so um, let's get started. Um, do we need to do this whole clap if you can hear me thing again? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, okay, clap if you can hear me. Uh, clap twice if you can hear me. All right, that, that's such a nice trick. <laughs> All right, it's so effective, yes. So, um, right, so this time we have 20 minutes rather than two hours, so we're going to abbreviate a lot. Um, so anyway, so uh, let's first, um, there's supposed to be a round of self-introduction and we assume that's already done. And then afterwards, um, yeah, what, why don't the city government uh, respond to the police statements and share with us what's the current status on data protection and sharing of the city government? Speaking on behalf of the uh, Economic Development Corporation. The city, uh, first of all, um, want to just remind everyone that uh, a great deal of uh, personal data that the city collects is already available. Uh, people simply need to file a FOIL request under the city's open records law, and unless there's a, a very pertinent reason to withhold it, you can get that information. So clearly some of the comments from the public suggests that we have not done a good enough job of educating people about what, they're, what they can already get access to. Uh, but in addition with the concern that we want to express is that, uh, that in the, as, as people evaluate what, what is to be done to further strengthen people's uh, ability to manage their own data, that we not impose uh, uh, onerous new regulations that might choke uh, uh, the tech industry in New York or the, all the innovation industries and cause them to leave the city and go elsewhere um, because we're coming up with things that are just impossible for developers to handle. Yeah. My colleagues may have additional things to say. Hello, so I am uh, working in the Department of Technology and Innovation and I think that the statesmen that are 
like the ones that got the majority of votes, uh, vast majority of votes were through, uh, one is a concern about understanding what data we are collecting from our residents and how are we using it. And we agree that we need more transparency and we're going to move forward uh, and focus our efforts in this aspect of, of what was said during this exercise. But uh, I think what's going to be harder is the, the other statement that says that residents should be able to access certain data sets for organizing but not raise privacy concerns. Uh, and, and I think that uh, um, arises a lot of questions that we would like to hear the experts, the academics, civil society and private sector. What do you have to say about that? Because if you are saying that you want data to organize, it means uh, data to, to reach out and so how not to violate privacy concerns and at the same time empower people to get more connected to each other and to their community that has same beliefs and same opinions and will may benefit from uh, understanding better who's with them in what. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the general idea is that you need more transparency, you agree with this general sentiment, but how this transparency does not interfere with the privacy concerns, is that something the academics may uh, shed something on? So any reflections about this fact? Yes, uh, we are from a think tank called open data and maybe different levels of data. Um, and uh, so from the polls, it's, it's clear that the majority of participants responded that they have high speed internet and they're old enough to vote. That means that we are only talking to a very specific group of people uh, who have responded to the poll and our suggestion is that we have to reach out to more communities to diversify and be more inclusive of our uh, data suggestions and legislations. Um, we uh, believe that from the poll that most people don't know that data is being collected on them by the city and therefore we want to pose two questions to the government and the citizen group. One is uh, what is the role of government in educating its people about open data and um, what are the data that, that what is the data that the government is already collecting on uh, citizens um, and from that we would love for the citizen group to respond with uh, how do you feel about those data being collected what do you want to include or take take away from the data that is being collected on you and uh, from all of that we would like to suggest that there needs to be different levels of data privacy and openness for government citizen bodies and uh, pri uh, private sectors but we are here to talk about that with everyone else. Well, that's great. Any other points uh, from the academics? Okay, right. So um, it seems that um, people are generally um, want a, a very transparent um, kind of metadata list of what data is currently being collected. Can I get a very quick factual check on do you already have this in the government? Uh, in the city government? We, we already have been working on that um, and it's a long process that is not yet <laughs> concluded. And we're excited to roll out a series of educational brochures. <laughs> Okay, that's great. That's great. So, so, so there are actually already brochures. Um, are, are there are they in um, like PDF form? Like, are they accessible online or at the moment only in public libraries? No. no. Okay, so it, it's only in paper form. Uh, so that's that's a fact. <laughs> okay, right. So that's our introductory briefing. So um, people from the um, private sector, uh, I'm sure that there's tech industry people here that um, are supposedly benefiting from the simple regulations. Uh, do you agree with the, the existing directions that the academics and the city officials are, are going? And uh, what are some of your hopes and fears uh, looking at this uh, current picture? Thank you for having us. Well, as the economic engine fueling job growth in one of the greatest cities on the planet, New York City businesses already face one of the highest tax rates in the nation. And we concur with our colleagues in the Economic Development Corporation that uh, 
you know, onerous regulation is not the answer. We believe that self-regulation in the private sector has worked. And in fact, we'd be willing to share some of these solutions with our government friends for a small fee. And we would hate for any additional costs of regulation to be inevitably passed on to the consumers of New York City. Colleagues. Um, we concur uh, with some of the statements um, said by the think tank about that as the private sector uh, providing a lot of different services, we would like kind of a special degree of access to a lot of private data so we can better serve residents of New York City. Um, and yes, as my colleague uh, mentioned earlier, we are, you know, the tech giants in this space. We have over 30 years of experience with big data, so we're really well equipped to provide uh, services for the government if they need a more secure, if you know what I'm saying, way to protect their data. We have a little bit more experience in that department. Hi, thank you. I, I just want to say how important this discussion is. And... Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we believe, since, since we have such a strong relationship with all of the, the citizens of New York City, we're committed to a public-private civic partnership to help design the systems that are going to work for the citizens of New York. That's great. So can I ask just one quick clarifying question? Uh, when you say self-regulation, um, what, what do you have in mind? Can you come up with one particular example of the so-called already established uh, self-regulatory um, thing that, that's going on in the private sector? Well, a any of you can, can come up with. It doesn't have to yeah. be true. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is true. We, we love our customers, and we are sure to present um, you know, detailed privacy policies every time someone signs up for a service. They consent to right. So, so privacy policies um, and informed consent. Um, okay, right. So, um, so does this make sense to you? Um, are, are there any citizens here who want to <laughs> add something? Um, our demands are very simple. We want to know what data is being collected, by whom, and for what. Uh, we want it to be easy to access and easy to understand. That's it. And we don't necessarily have a ton of confidence that the city can, can, can protect us or necessarily utilize it in our favor, so we're, we're a bit weary. Right. Uh, just adding to that, also, we also want to have the ability to, to know all those things and also have the ability to turn off what we'd like. Uh, turning off as in stirring um, or? To have control over, to, to opt control. out. Yeah, like, to like opt updating, out keeping the data up to date or? Opt out or of opting who out can of access. processing. Yeah. Okay. So both access to how it's currently being used uh, and also either editing or opting out uh, of further processing, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, the sovereignty of being able, they may need to collect our data for some particular purpose, right? So age verification, um, location verification, but we should have the sovereignty that that isn't used for marketing materials and that at any one particular time period, we can have that shit deleted. Okay, which is, well, synonym to this. So I'll just, um, so any other inputs from our... Society. Okay, if not, there's some online uh, statements as well. Uh, so I'll just pick one if for the interest of time. Um, there's this Cordelia person <laughs> who said <laughs> that data collected by the city, um, she tried figuring out how to access uh, data on May, and it was totally impossible because it already costs $150 per request and nearly 20 hours of work, and so no one can really read through those uh, detailed uh, policies, right? So it, is it, so f quick fact check, is it actually true that uh, one has to pay uh, like 150 bucks for no, that, that, That's incorrect. All freedom of information requests are free. Uh, they, there is no cost to the resident to, when they make a request. Um, so uh, I have no idea where that $150 is coming from. By the way, I do want to add that our city is the safest city. We, we recently rolled out an initiative um, to protect New Yorkers from uh, cyber war. And um, you can, 
uh, all the city public Wi-Fi services now uh, have had additional protections added. And um, as a user, there is a free app that we've made available to people that they can download, which will tell them if while they're browsing the web using our Wi-Fi, if they're visiting sites that are known sites containing malware. So that makes New York the safest city. We are doing everything possible to protect people here from cyber war. Awesome. Uh, we are second to none. Uh, OK, thank you for your commitment. And by the way, uh, everything <laughs> I just said was, was announced by our mayor a month ago. He literally said those things. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very important to have that commitment. Um, sorry, I, I, I see some people raising hands about the FOIA or some other requests. Uh, I, when I filed my last FOIL request um, to be delivered uh, via hard drive, um, I still had to pay 10 cents per record. That was from the Economic Development Corporation. I'm sorry, my mic isn't working right now. I can't. <laughs> okay, so that's a future point of clarification. Uh, we can follow up um, right after this meeting. Uh, and I see that everybody really uh, agrees on um, the, a more transparency on what data is being accessed to and used and for the right to, to keep it up to date to, or opting out. Are there anyone um, like, yes? Hi, I'm uh, NYPD. Uh, just to remind folks that we are constantly protecting the citizens of New York. That's our number one priority. Any issue involving privacy while we work on at, at the request of the mayor, um, we have to recognize the realities of the situation. Of course, we're a center of global terror as well as there's a wide variety of reasons why the data that we collect, w no one would want us to share. Uh, I mean, I could go through a variety of different contingencies and scenarios about what that would be. But, you know, obviously our intentions are always to be as forthright as possible with New Yorkers and to work uh, with the mayor and, um, you know, various city agencies and civil society organizations to ensure that, you know, we're doing the best job possible, but we also have to be aware that this is a, this is a balance, this is a dance, and that security comes first. Right, so you, you said that security is important. Uh, as for both the application and uh, for you know safeguarding the privacy concerns, I think everybody here kind of agrees with that. Is the underlying cybersecurity, but I'm very happy that you're committed to it. So uh, about about the access to the current uses and uh, editing uh, and keeping data up to date, as well as opting out, um, I heard that the government is is pretty okay on this regard, even though that technologically they may need some help. Um, so, so, and I understand that this multinational here already <laughs> has some, some, uh, something that they're, they're willing to share. So about this particular reflection about more transparency and more system control, are there any other statements that adds to the current consensus? No? Okay, we're good. Right, so, um, and the other point that's being brought out was that um, of this police conversation, they're mostly from people with high-speed internet access, and we do need to include more diverse people into this conversation. Um, does anyone here, regardless of the sector, have any uh, experience in reaching out to people who do not have high-speed internet access uh, and educate uh, them about their right to data and about policies, uh, outreach and inclusivity, yes? In the business district that uh, we, we participate in, uh, we do provide high-speed internet access. Uh, there is some advertising that pays, that, that facilitates that service, but um, we've allowed anyone who is a shop, any, any person who comes shopping or just strolling in our district can access the high-speed internet. Okay, that's great. It's a, like an infrastructure uh, that you offer at no cost, but some advertising. Yeah, to, to people, yes. So thank you for providing that option. Um, are, are there any issue um, or any thoughts around this kind of free basic internet pay by advertising access? Are there any thoughts around it? If not, we're just you know keeping it as one option to increase the diversity and access to public information. Um, so um, I think that's pretty much resolved, and we don't have any time left either. So, <laughs> so uh, but but that that was just a a, a very quick um, mock-up of a. 
potential uh, like from facts to contributed reflections to address each other's reflections to actionable uh, like outcomes. Um, and it's not the highest quality facilitation I've done, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but you, usually you can come up with something that could translate into future actions that could be tracked on part of the V Taiwan platform, especially if this is part of the public private citizen partnership <laughs> program as, as suggested, right? So yeah, I think uh, we still have like 10 more minutes. So um, if, if, yes. Are actionable items usually discussed during the facilitation session also? Okay. Yes. So uh, if people have made promises, like uh, if like there are contention points, uh, can we close the Zoom? Uh, yeah, so um, why are the poor always the most surveilled communities? That, that is actually a great question. I wish I have two more hours to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, yes. Typically, how much time would be set aside for this period of discussion? Right, so two hour at a minimum, uh, and usually it's from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, on a weekday, and th that, they, that this time slot is very carefully chosen so that everybody around different sectors put in roughly the same effort. Uh, and uh, the venue is within the administration. Uh, it's one of the um, um, designated multi-stakeholder meeting room in the administration itself. And so one of the reasons that we don't allow walk-in registration is that there is armed guards uh, <laughs> to, to the outside of the administration building. It's, it's really um, seen as symbolic as this is taken by the administration as one of the ministerial, like cross-ministry level meetings that has binding power um, to all the agencies involved. So the um, physical side itself is also very symbolic. And uh, the time slot, we, tr we tried uh, various different configurations, but a weekday, usually Thursday, at 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., that could be extended to 10 p.m. or so, uh, is a balance between the effort that different sector people have to put in, and also it doesn't compete with other uh, more popular television shows uh, that people <laughs> have. <laughs> and, and so it ensure more online participation <laughs> because it is turning into one of the int more interesting television shows. So thank you for a asking, but, but yeah, we really had to compete with other live house and other um, popular live stream shows uh, to for people's attention. Yeah. Um, any other? Yes. And what is the outcome? Yes. So the outcome is basically a set of factual corrections or factual clarification that's needed. For example, does each FOI request actually require 10 cents and uh, are there Sometimes there are multiple ways. There are ways that cost more, there are ways that are free, but the, f the ways that are free are not known to people. That's one possibility actually that we see usually uh, in such discussions. So usually the minister right on the spot, uh, because everything is uh, kept in the transcript, right? So we can annotate the transcript like in, in real time and right after the meeting to ask each agency to post a follow-up uh, point by point respond uh, to the factual, the objective layer of things so that at least everybody learns a little bit more about what's currently factual and going on but may not be a widespread knowledge to people. So that, that always happens. Uh, and the second thing is that we check people's feelings. So. Um, for example, it's very clear that people here have some very shared sentiments, but the written form may not allow them to go into a lot more detail. So that is being expanded, as we can see here, of what the hopes and fears and other emotions um, actually um, entail uh, in, in, in terms of personal experience. And some people share their story and things like that. So that also lets the policymakers, when they see similar uh, reflections or feelings in the future, they have a, a better understanding 
understanding of the context where it's happening, and also they have the contact of these people where they can contact uh, like at any time, really, um, to serve as um, potential contributors to future meetings. That's the reflective part. Now, the uh, interpretative part or the possible ideas, for example, a PPC partnership on uh, bringing high-speed access, uh, um, accessibility uh, to, to people who are not as well connected. That's one possible um, actionable result of this meeting, although it's kind of orthogonal to our original topic. Uh, what, what's much more likely to be actionable is to set up a transparency um, report-ish uh, framework where the, the various sectors uh, work together to let people uh, know what data is currently being accessed and opted uh, out on, this, on that portal. So what, what's likely to result of that particular portion is collaborative workshops to co-determine uh, the user experience of that particular um, data access portal. So if the, because uh, it was, as I understand, uh, the agencies um, volunteer already <laughs> to, to build it, uh, the next thing for the minister to do is actually to just secure a budget uh, for that that part to happen and the seed um, input to the vendor doing that collaboration meeting will be the transcript of whatever people have said on that particular part. And I also see that the uh, educational uh, material currently only in paper form in brochure uh, can actually m do some expanding as well. <laughs> and, 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 and that's uh, another possible action item. So uh, right after the meeting uh, in the next mini hackathon, uh, each of these areas will be explored and each agency who are in favor of this idea will uh, outline both the resource they have and the resource they need to make it happen. And, and, and that will result in um, other actions that will uh, be posted on the VTI1 um, bulletin. So as I, as I mentioned the, the, in the ORID method, the, the facts, the feelings, and the ideas, these three are taken care of to some degree in the VTAWA consultation meeting, but it's not a place where we do decisions. So all the decisional parts are the second diamond uh, in the design thinking happens after this meeting. So this meeting is really just a little bit in the first diamond after this diverse polis stuff to try to synthesize things a little bit so that we can agree on common problem statement and things um, that could be solutions uh, in the middle of the two diamonds. And for example, in this mock meeting, we end up with three possible touch points and each of which will grow into its own second diamond. Uh, afterwards, but uh, people here get notification and invitations to those future meetings. It's a long answer, but yeah. So, oh, can I? Oh, yeah, yeah. someone else. No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just noticed in this session. Oh, I too near something? Uh, <laughs> I noticed in this session the uh, business and government officials kind of just steered a lot of the conversation. Yeah. And do you find that that happens, not necessarily between these two camps, but do we find that like there are some groups that steer conversation? And are there steps that, you, that facilitators take, like either by balancing time or putting out provocations or something to get more balance? First question. Second question is about like the, uh, the, the, the detail richness of the conversation. I feel like if the outputs from this session are meant to be co-design prompts and so on uh, for subsequent work, um, you know, in order to get a full uh, sense of the landscape, we kind of have to like define what we're talking about. Are we talking about medical data, you know, public health data? You know, are we talking about surveillance footage? Are we talking about IP addresses from hotspots? You know, like w when we're talking about data writ large, it's hard to get into the details. So. I, I wonder what kinds of things we would wor work on in a co-design session afterwards. Right, right. That, that's, that that's right. So, so that's why we always uh, use uh, reference classes, if possible, like police network camera. Right. So that's one reference class that we can use as a motivating example, by no means uh, exhaustive on the facilitated sessions. Uh, and we then gradually branch out into other kinds of data and other kind of uses uh, in maybe focus groups uh, or co-design workshops after the um, consultation meeting. So the consultation meeting is really only meant for people to voice their concerns, their, their hopes and fears, and their general ideas. And it's OK to not have consensus at the consultation meeting uh, and with even you know the, the this parts where the facts are even disputed it's impossible to have 
a real discussion around that. So one of the action items is just to clear up the, the facts. Now the facilitator does have to balance the time, uh, especially the civil society people uh, um, may need a lot of interpretation and translation. That's actually the job of the academics. So <laughs> supposedly the academics here are supposed to, when people raise concerns or fears or whatever, a facilitator should cue the academics to reframe their language into the context of what's being discussed and we don't get the time to do that here. And also the online people tend to be very vocal. So uh, again, at uh, points where people are generally feeling pretty calm and comfortable and resolve things, provocative questions from the online part start to come in and then and then we, we, we do another uh, round uh, resolving the issues like uh, the, the correlation between the poor and the surveillance, that that's actually a very good provocative question that we can easily spend another 20 minutes on um, and to, to balance the time. So yes, that's one of the things the facilitator need to do and the facilitator really uh, can use the um, online part of the chat room as a, um, a process that actually there's a lot of co-editors online that try to sort uh, the relevance of the online conversation uh, that are pertinent to particular areas. The facilitator is doing, that's the co-facilitating team. Uh, usually we have two to three people doing that uh, in real time on a hackpad. This is directly uh, in, related to the workflow with this aspect. So this is Zoom, right? Yeah. And do you have like a full-fledged like professional Zoom account, I assume? Uh-huh. Um, and then with the, how does this Zoom kind of like whiteboarding integrate with the, the hack pad. Mm -hmm. This is your no notes and then you say that there was somebody else who's sitting in the yes. room and like transcribing yes. that? Yes, yes. So, um, right, so on the, currently we use YouTube Live, but yeah, it could be Zoom or anything. Um, the, the layout is, is like this, it's chat room here uh, and uh, whiteboard here uh, and um, right, and then the camera. Um, so usually when two sides are talking, you see two people, uh, but, and with their respective name cards, actually. So right, it, it's, it's laid out this way on a typical YouTube Live uh, channel. But it, at the same time, and it's pinned to the top, usually, uh, the link to the hackpad. So people who don't have um, you know, earphones or, or people who are not uh, visually inclined can follow exactly the same discussion, but explicitly in the textual form, uh, only on Hackpad. And the Hackpad will always start with a embedded YouTube, right? So, so you can always click and go back here. And then, um, and people here just summarize the points that's being made in the face-to-face -face meeting. And then there's a section of the incoming uh, inquiries uh, right, so incoming questions, really, um, that is being copy-pasted, essentially, from here um, and ignoring all the trolls uh, into here. And so, so this is actually what the uh, facilitator sees, usually in another tablet. Uh, so both the recorded summaries so that they can uh, copy some of this into the whiteboard here and as well as the more pertinent questions uh, crowdsourced from the uh, live streamed uh, chat room that they can bring to a face-to-face -face, uh, provocation. So, so you have two, just for clarification, you had, tend to have two tablets. Um, I assume that they're like Apple tablets with the, with the Apple Pen one, that's for your whiteboard. And then you have another one which yes. is just the, the hack pad. That's right, that's okay. right, exactly. So, so this one, usually we use um, iPad, well, iPad Pro, but now iPad works too, uh, with, with Apple Pencil, but before that we used a normal laptop or even large whiteboard with um, still stylus uh, technologies, but now we're mostly set on Apple Pencil uh, to the whiteboarding part, uh, and the hackpad is usually kept on another tablet, and we usually use tablets because uh, that doesn't create a distance between the facilitator and people, because uh, like, it's not like, it's not shielded, yeah. So, yes? Um, I was kind of, uh, I unexpectedly experienced like the frustration of being in a meeting like this and feeling that like certain issues are getting passed over and then things just move on. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, like, for example, it seemed to me, like, from the poll list, the most contentious um, and one of the most important questions was about, like, surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. And we kind of, like, mm -hmm. got around it, and then we're like, okay, time's up. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you experienced, like, or if you have any, um, mm -hmm. anything further about, like, that experience of people feeling like this process can't encompass mm -hmm. um, what they're hoping to achieve and, and getting burnt yeah. out by this kind of deliberation. Right, so, um, so keep in mind that we only spend maybe 15 minutes in a what should be a two hour um, process. So in the two hour process, it's usually um, there are um, touch points where we quickly summarize what's been discussed before and we ask around what people feel that are exactly the things that are being passed over and worth elaborating. Uh, usually that's during such segmentation time that we bring a new batch of input from online people also. Uh, so there's usually two to three synchronization points during the two hour meeting. Uh, but still, yeah, there, there should there, there's always some topics that are not explored in depth enough uh, in, in such meetings. And usually what people do is that they type uh, their um, points that still needs clarified and they get collected from the chat room here to the hackpad here. And then the minister at the end of the conversation, like suppose Avros is the minister, uh, she will read from the hackpad and say, we understand that there are such this, this is like five points that still needs more elaboration on, and we task the ministries within seven days to go back to the V Taiwan online forum and provide detailed uh, explanation of these problems and open more collaborative meetings if uh, needed be. So usually the minister's um, role really is to summarize what has been reached and to outline the openings uh, that still needs clarification. And so the whole spirit is that this consultation meeting is at the middle of a v process, right? So it's between the online divergence part and the second part of more focused either um, special interest group meetings, focus group meetings, or some other process. So this is uh, like a continuation point between two um, divergence uh, parts. So this is usually the spirit that the minister try to convey in that there's always the, uh, another future meeting that you, you will be all invited. That is the, the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. I, I want to go back to, I think, David, something that he had raised about the breadth of issues that are covered and your invitations or who sits at the table because you have this lump category of civil society which I'm assuming is a mix of citizens and groups or associations that represent special interests. Like, how do you how do you well, engage? Sorry, right. So do, the the private sector table here is because it's more of a private sector thing, right? But in NCII, it's actually large NGOs that sit here, right? So like more old power <laughs> uh, organizations are, are actually in this corner and the generalized civil society are mo mostly people who are not representing other people but themselves that's the that's the real distinction uh, but yeah depending on topic we may label things differently but that's the, the difference right, so so people in this corner are people who think they represent other people so you don't have business then? It's one or the other, or do you have? No, no, no. You, you you can have both. Like in Uber, it's both the union of taxi, like the head of the union, uh, and uh, Uber itself, and some other taxi companies. They're they're all in this corner. Like they all presume to speak for thousands of other people, but the civ generalized civil society here generally speak just for themselves or their family, right? How do you uh, signal the conclusion of a meeting in a way that people feel good about? Right, um, that's the hardest part. Um, so, so we always go over time in v and consultation meetings. That's not a secret. Uh, so <laughs> people, people receive that it's from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., but actually it's to 9.30. We have one that goes almost to 10 p.m. So, so usually it ends with quite a few rounds of uh, just simple recapping of what's going on and just assessing people's um, feelings uh, of whether they feel it's good enough. 
now if it's as diverse as this, right, uh, the threshold is just, you know, people won't kill themselves because of this, right? <laughs> but if it's more convergent, it, it's, it could be people are generally ha happy with it, but not happy, not a fine consensus so that not one letter can be changed, but generally happy with it. So the facilitator will, will sense the, the divergence and verbalize this degree of divergence and check whether this verbalization, like we can live with it, uh, is okay with people here, and then uh, read out the action items uh, task to the agency. But that part is usually uh, after confirming uh, the people's general sentiment, uh, the, the reading out the actions is delegated to the minister. Well, but the people crowdsourcing uh, the statements and so on, they're usually already prepared maybe 80% of what the minister has to say. Of course, she can add more things to it. Yeah. Do, do you use like any of these like hand signals to gauge sentiment? We, we tried that, uh, yeah, but, but no, not, not anymore. <laughs> so um, on online chat rooms, uh, we, we use a lot of smileys and, and things like that, but no, in, in this kind of uh, meetings so far, because everybody can see everybody's face, uh, we, we find the more like um, hand gestures and things like that. They're more equipped if people don't have at least five minutes to 10 minutes of their, their time mm -hmm. to say things, uh, and also it works if people can't uh, generally see each other's face, but in such an arrangement, it's uh, seldom needed, yeah. Thanks. I just, uh, just one thing. I just wanna um, thank you, Audrey, for giving me such a nice way of saying, we are we are obviously over yeah. the time that just we just like had. Things, <laughs> just, yes. It's the real deal here. Um, so respectfully, if there are folks that do have to leave, that is uh, quite okay. Um, Otherwise, we're happy to, to take a few more questions and, and continue this, this, this discussion. Um, is there prime produce people? Yeah, we, we should wrap up um, gradually, but there was a question. Uh, yeah, just building on that last one, when you say like when, recapping so that people are happy, is it that you know, the various stakeholders feel heard? Is it that they have you know, like an action point to be discussed in the mini hackathon outlined in red? Like, what is that combination that you found works and like, how do you determine that? Well, it's, it's mostly an art. <laughs> I, well, th there's, there's a, a few um, rule of thumb and they're just meant to be taken as rules of thumb. First, that it's important to recap always the common values. Um, so um, if the police surface something that people generally um, are their common fears, their common hopes, their common uh, values that they identify as important, it's important to uh, go back to those and to uh, read again for the people involved that their contribution makes those common values even more uh, manifest. And, and that tend to bring everybody to a higher function level. And then the other rule of thumb is based on that, we uh, face the contentions uh, and uh, potential actions that could, could lead to resolution of those contentions. Uh, that's also worth reading out loud. And one trick is that to read exactly as the wording that's being kept on the, on the whiteboard <laughs> so that people feel respected for the particular words that they chose. And if there are particular uh, groups of people, pockets of people who are um, not okay uh, with that particular wording and such as alternative wording, it's worth it to also repeat that in the recap so that both feel respected and kept in the full transcript record. That applies doubly actually to the online chat room. So what I just demoed is actually a counter example because there's a bunch of very relevant online chat room statement that were not being read out loud. But if there is time, though, those should totally be read out loud. Yeah. Any other final questions? Yes. I'm curious, what do you wish you could improve about this process? Oh, there's tons of ways <laughs> that, that this could improve. Um, so um, I think uh, three main things. Uh, the first thing is that this process, what we found, usually works only if people have first-hand experience that are 
broadly speaking, compatible, so that when people hear the same word, like uh, UberX, they have some idea of what people are work talking about. So like for data integration, before the consultation meeting, uh, the actual VTOWN process actually goes through like three focus group, like five pre-meetings or, or whatever like that, just to get each word and its glossary and its definitions uh, fixed in place so that everybody can know what we're talking about so that we, we don't, you know, go like this <laughs> and instead of explore one specific branch. Uh, but the time and resource needed for pre-meetings, um, it's infinite. You can, you can always do that infinitely. Uh, and usually there's a time constraint, like a consultation meeting really has to happen in two months months or three months, um, like uh, because of legislative or other political forces at play. So we can always do the preparation work better, but the reality is that we always end up with some ambiguities that are nevertheless taking a lot of time in the consultative meetings that could be avoided if we had to do more preparation meetings, but it's okay, I guess. So that's the first thing, it's the common uh, imagery. Uh, the second thing is the facilitative uh, method itself. What we are doing this is, is kind of a whiteboarding exercise. Uh, there's no common code for what is an action, what is the fact, and it's all up to the facilitator's personal style. Uh, and that we're trying to improve, and that will be tomorrow's workshop. Uh, where we're trying to bring a shared code uh, to, to these kind of processes, and, um, yeah, and for the benefit of online participants especially, uh, that's very important. And the third thing is to increase the um, regularity of going through this process. Uh, the Digital Communication Act that's going to be passed about two months from now explicitly said that all digital issues that concerns multiple ministries need to go through some process like this. But before the act is passed, it is somewhat selective. And because of this selection, we're kind of dependent on the goodwill of agency of, of following through uh, those action items. And so sometimes the agency, if they don't have the resource, they will sound very reluctant or defensive, and that um, degrades the quality of the consultation meeting. Uh, so, so that's the three things that I, I think could improve. So I guess that's it. Uh, sorry, one final question? Uh, sure. Um, Taiwan obviously is a democracy. Administrations come and they go. What is the v, v Taiwan? What's your position as digital minister and V Taiwan's position uh, in terms of like the long-term uh, democratic scene of Taiwan? When you know an administration might come, a legislature might change, parties might change. Do you feel like? You're in a position where you kind of have like what we'd call bipartisan support and have institutionalized this. If yes, how? If not, what's next under various contingencies? Right, so the veto and part is not institutionalized at all at this point. What's institutionalized is the national participation platform, which is, has like almost 5 million participants out of a 23 million country, so it's a large number of participants, uh, but it's much less um, research-ish. It's, it's what all the regulations, all the budget items, and all the petitions uh, can, can go through. And that part is very well institutionalized. There's a national regulation about it. There's even a regulation about participation offices. And it, there starts to be regulation about, in each ministry, how the participation offices are going to organize. And so that part is the institutional arm that we're working with. Now, V Taiwan itself, especially when it concerns truly cross-sectoral multinational like Uber-ish things. Um, I, I think it really needs to be institutionalized, but maybe not with the name V Taiwan. That's why in the Digital Communication Act, we end up with the wording that says a um, open multi-stakeholder process, not necessarily initiated by the government. We settle on this wording so that it doesn't need to be V Taiwan or Gov Zero. It could be the Internet Governance Forum. It could be any other community that satisfies this standard <coughs> could still, uh, by law, have a partnership relationship with the government. So V Taiwan is not uh, monopolizing uh, this um, contact point with the government. That's my personal uh, st standpoint. But many other V Taiwan uh, contributors differ with me on this opinion. So take it with a grain of salt. That's why we need a, a large debate on the, the future of V-Taiwan after the Digital Communication Act passes.
Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, I can tell you what my plan is after this, and that is that we have a very important decision to make whether or not we want to go to a Mexican-style margaritas-type bar establishment or more of a local beer uh, establishment. Both have moderate prices and are within a half block of here. I was hoping that we could slide o this. I don't know if we are prepared exactly for it. In which case, we could do an old-fashioned hand raise if people have strong ideas. If not, we can all just gather over here and make the decision in an ad hoc manner. But I feel like I'm in a position where I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming. And more information from the organizers will be coming forthwith, which means very shortly, in moments. Just, just one more thing. There's actually a, a short uh, questionnaire asking for your feedback on, you know, uh, the process and what you learned, what you found interesting. We'll send out the link. If you can take it, that would be awesome. And if you don't, we'll hound you tomorrow. If you're interested as well, um, Prime Produce ha recently had a really neat cybernetics conference, and there's some neat books out over in the registration area um, that are cybernetics related to also like organizational structures and participation that you're free to peruse through. Um, but yes, as you. Tomorrow's going to be real fun. It's going to start at 9 o'clock slash 9.30, absolutely hard, like definitely starting. There will be a reception beginning at 6.30 exactly. tomorrow evening, which you are all invited to invite other people to, although not particularly on the internet in a way that's widely distributed. Um, but p other people are, you know, there's over 50, 60 people have RSVP'd. There will be alcohol for donation style sale, which will be very useful. Um, and we are uh, going to be in great shape. So. This is, it's all going to be here starting 6.30, and... There's also uh, food, and there will also be non-alcoholic drinks as well. Absolutely. MC. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>